Wave. Welcome back to the Magic Minds podcast. I'm Matt Bork. Welcome back. This is our studio. This is the first time we've done a video intro. Uh, I have put some stuff on Facebook. Uh, like with vlogs and all that kind of stuff. People have seen us. So this is the first revelation from the podcast viewers or listeners. So this is our new studio. We've lights, camera, action, backdrop. Thanks to Noel Riley from Rudy Media for designing an absolutely amazing uh, backdrop. It's fucking brilliant. How far have we come? Thanks to our sponsor uh, who donated uh, table, chairs, lights, uh, and the, the tri new tripod. I'm absolutely delighted. He doesn't want me to reveal who he is, the dodgy bastard. Uh, but we really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, pal. Uh, it means a lot to me. Uh, an absolute legend. And obviously, thanks to Aaron and Kev. The team fucking brilliant work that they do so look we're really progressing it's absolutely fantastic and really so because i truly believe that this podcast is going to be even more successful going forward due to all the interviews of the people we've done they're absolutely amazing i believe in my heart and soul that they are stories that have the the power to inspire and they inspired me i'm getting amazing feedback on facebook and social media about the interviews about the, the vlogs that i'm putting out but they're only snippets of the interviews that I've done there and snippets of the learning that I have gathered since doing the podcast and my own journey so it's a it's a two-way road we're working on here I'm being inspired and then we're inspiring people through their stories so it's a it's an absolute brilliant uh, journey that we're all on so anyway keep watching our Magic Minds podcast keep sharing and telling the people about all these amazing stories uh, yeah, so where are we? Where are we at? Where are we at? Okay, last week's podcast was with Paddle Timmons. Got great feedback about that. He's an absolute legend, uh, an old school pal of mine. Himself and Rachel went through IVF, and that was a brilliant journey. So I'm delighted to bring that. Uh, it's kind of very kind of timely and serendipity that I, I got someone on about IVF because it's something I really wanted to learn about people's struggles, and then also then. I was really interested in autism, autism awareness, and you know, I work in disabilities, so that's something that I'm passionate about. So, to get somebody on to talk about uh, autism was brilliant. And I got a gentleman on by the name of Mark O'Keefe. I've done a vlog about this a few weeks ago, uh, just after doing the interview. It was a powerful interview, but it really reminded me of the struggles that people are going through in marginalized groups, in uh, disabilities, disadvantaged. You know, if you're not in a sector that society deems you to be normal, you're cast aside. And, and that interview, this interview really shone through to me or was shining a light on that as well for me, you know. And the struggles that Mark and Amy have gone through with Riley. Riley was diagnosed with autism and he's got really uh, difficult. He's got really... Uh, uh, issues around you know his communication and Mark shared that the struggles that him and the family are going through the struggles that they've had trying to get him you know into education mainstream education SNA support you know funding has been pulled from it you know it's it's just it's really difficult and to hear the story but look they're like many other families out there that are struggling they're just getting by they're doing the best they can you know uh, so yeah, check out this interview. Mark is a, a fantastic guy, great uh, speaker, great uh, uh, insight for me to learn about autism, to learn about disabilities, to learn about the struggles that people are having. You know, each disability is different. Each child that has autism is different. You know, but the one thing that I always take away from interviews with people like this. That we're all the same we all have struggles if it's not autism it's, it's spinal mental health suicide we're all human we all have the same struggles we're all in the same boat rowing in the same way so that's something that i'll always remind people when they listen to the podcast okay you might not have a child that has autism or some new disability but you might know someone that has a struggle and struggles are struggles Struggles are struggles, whether it's mental health, whether it's brain injury, whether it's spinal, whether it's uh, IVF and stigma around sexuality. We're all fucking struggling. We're all struggling. So bear that in mind when you listen to these podcasts. There's somebody out there struggling. And if you can see and you can help out or try to be understanding or practice empathy or practice uh, listen, 
that would be an invaluable service to, to them and your community, you know. So that's what I'm trying to do with the podcast is bring so many diverse uh, interviews that you can see the whole spectrum of society and the struggles that will happen. And hopefully through that, you will be inspired to do good in society or in your community. So yeah, so that is the crack. So yeah, have a listen to the Mark O'Keefe interview about Riley. Brilliant. And he wrote an amazing letter as well. Jeez, I read the letter and I was bawling my eyes out as a father, as a therapist, as a human being. I just absolutely loved it. He's a great guy uh, and an absolutely beautiful family. So yeah, that's the interview. We've got a cracking one coming up next in two weeks. That's with Ken Doyle from The Bag of Tell. And uh, went down to his gaff and told me about ghosts and ghosts in the house. At the end of the interview, he shit myself. Uh, his time with, with Bagatelle, they're still rocking on. So that's coming out in two weeks. That's a brilliant interview as well. I loved it from his house. So yeah, that's it with the interviews. As always, uh, I want to thank Noy Roy from Rooney Media Graphics for the amazing work that they do. We've got business cards. We've, we have a website coming along as well. Uh, with loads of progression. Uh, Aaron and Kev, amazing lads on the team. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate your input. Uh, what else? Shannon's Hopeline. Uh, low cost counselling in the Dublin area. The girls are doing amazing work educating the grassroots children around mental health, depression, suicide, all that kind of stuff. Love those girls. The mental health warriors, Fran Dempsey, brilliant work with the Delivery Soup run, helping the homeless. Yeah, that's it, really. Who else? No one else to thank. Uh, thank Mr. Eastwood. I was getting stick on uh, on Facebook. They've done a thank you video. People were slagging me. You didn't thank Mr. Eastwood. I'm thanking everyone. So yeah, that's it. But we have a meditation group on Facebook. If you want to head over there, Magic Minds Meditation. I do live meditation on a Monday. Uh, we're on all the social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Add us, add us, get our followers going, share our videos. We really want you to share our videos, share our podcasts. Please give us your feedback. Feedback is absolutely fantastic. We'll get amazing texts on Facebook and Instagram. People are really enjoying the videos and one out the little vlogs. And loving our podcast this is all about uh, creating a bigger community a bigger magic minds community so we can uh, inspire other people so that's it there you go me bacon bowl is is out and i'm bringing it back in have a fantastic day and as always mind your little self in service of the rest of the world and enjoy the interview bye bye okay so we're live welcome back to the magic minds podcast i'm matt bork on the show today i'm joined by a special guest mark o'keefe what's the crack Oh, good, Matt. Thank you. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm fantastic. Absolutely delighted to get you on the podcast. Pleasure to be here. Absolute pleasure. Guys, I've asked Mark to come on the show. Mark has a son called Riley. Uh, Riley was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Mm -hmm. So I've asked Mark to come on the show, you know, to represent his family, represent Riley, be a voice for him and other autistic children and the struggles of him, his family and people in Ireland, not just with autism, but disabilities and represents that people from a marginalized group are lower down the pecking order when it comes to priority, when it comes to services, supports, funding, you name it, society, acceptance, the whole lot. And hopefully we will do royally and other people from that uh, cohort uh, uh, justice. Yeah. And I think we will. Yeah, well, that's perfectly put for me. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel. Yeah, you know, this show is all about education, but then it's all about uh, raising awareness and hopefully raising you know, some profile for people with disabilities, people with autism, whatever. So yeah, look, give us a little insight to, to Riley and his diagnosis. What is, from your own perspective, what is autism spectrum disorder? Okay. <clears throat> well, first off the bat, I don't claim to be an expert in it, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm an expert in my son and I know his journey and our journey. And I'll tell you a little bit about Riley's journey from the beginning. Um, he's nearly six, he'll be six in November. And it was just before his third birthday when we were told and we got a diagnosis. But the, what led up to that was, as a child, when he was born, everything seemed to be going okay. Um, you know, he crawled when he should crawl and he walked when he should walk and he had learned to hold a spoon and hold his bottle and all those type of things. That was all perfectly fine. Um, but it was only when he kind of got to the stage when we thought he was certainly starting to speak, you know. So when you're kind of starting to expect mama and dada and that kind of thing and a bit more interaction with you as their parents and his brothers and sisters that that was kind of lacking a little bit but we were kind of advised that probably to get his hearing checked so that would just seem perfectly normal i've heard of people getting grommets wasn't particularly worried 
got him checked out. He says, yeah, there's definitely fluid there. He was booked into Temple Street to get a procedure done. And he was taken off for the procedure. We were obviously waiting in the waiting room. And he wasn't gone 10 minutes when the professor was looking after him, came up and brought us into a room and said, look, there's actually virtually no fluid on his, on his ears. So he doesn't need grommets. So what you need to do now is you need to go and get a diagnosis and you need to get early intervention because it's very important. And he pretty much went to leave the room and I was just like, hold on a second. What are you talking about? Diagnosis for what? Like, And um, Amy, my partner, was white and uh, the blood drained out of her body. And then he used the word autism for the first time. I can't remember in what way he brought it up to me and how he said it to me, but the word autism just hit us in the face, you know. And I didn't really know much about autism. I didn't really know what that entailed. I know I knew of it because Lisa and Keith Duffy made so much awareness mm. back in the day, and um, so I knew I knew I'd heard of it, but I didn't know what it was. And um, somebody once said said to me, actually, when you meet somebody with autism, you've only met one person with autism because it doesn't actually standardise anything. Everybody's completely different, as we all are as human beings, but t- particularly in in the autism community. Um, it can be very different. And with Riley's case, his he's, he's class has been non-verbal, right? But it's more than just being non-verbal. It's not that he just can't find his voice. It's the whole communication process is out of sync. So he, 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 would, he, he doesn't even process how to have that conversation or try and get the words out, you know? So we have to, we have to try and find a way to make that happen. Um, and, and that's really, he, you know, he was first diagnosed as being moderate on the, on the spectrum. We're very lucky because there's a lot of things he's very good at. He's very able. Um, he's very nimble and agile and all these things. You know, he's very physical. He's not overly sensory, so he's not over sensory with sound or lights or things like that. It's really the communication is the biggest issue for Riley. Yeah. I read that in, uh, I think you've done an interview with, with autism.ie or they mm. did a website, myself and Amy. And yeah, as I am. It's, as I am, yeah. yeah, brilliant. It was really, it was great interview. I read loads, excellent. I read back and forth, and that was excellent. And he doesn't have the sensory a lot of autistic kids do. Yes, but it's just similar to what I do. I work in brain injury. No brain injured person is the same. Yes. Same with autism, and it really shines through disability. The the differentiate between everybody. Yeah, and you can't label one autistic person the same. So there might be no. traits of the same. Of course, yeah. And it's nice. And then people will listen to this and go, well, my son doesn't do that, but he does this exactly. and he does this. Give us a little insight to his personality as a little boy. What's he like? Um, He's a very, very fun kid. He loves fun. He loves a rough and tumble. He loves adventure. And I think, like, he's a huge superhero fan. And I think for him, it's almost like he's trying to play out his own, his own superhero movie. Right. You know, he... He loves Star Wars and all these kind of things, you know. So you'll always see him with a stick or something in his hand. I think I'm convinced he thinks it's a lightsaber. Um, but you can't take your eye off Riley for two minutes because he's up to something. And if you don't hear him, you know he's up to something. So that's like typical to a lot of little boys, yeah. you know what I mean? And I read a deadly one, Daddy, with your little, the other little lad climbed the wall. Yeah. It's a big wall. Yeah. And he then made a kind of little ladder to yeah. get over it. Exactly. So I was like, fucking he's deadly. His older brother's 10, and he just scaled the wall into his mate's house next door. And like, literally, I sat there looking at him, you know, and. He could see his brother was gone. Where's he gone? He's always looking out to play with his, bro- bro- his yeah, big brother. Yeah, yeah. And he knew he jumped the wall. So next thing he started bringing all these slates over. He started building a bit of a ramp and he gets up on top of that and he was eventually got it high enough that he was able to get his fingers to the top of the wall and pull himself over the wall, you know? So, you know, you see things like that and you think how clever he is. Like, you know, that he, can, he's, he has the ability to be able to be creative like that, which is yeah. great. Gives you great hope. Uh, yeah, and I, I also read in that same post that he gave me to his ass where he strengths were mm. and determination. That mm. use that seems to be a big one with him. He's very determined, which is great. <laughs> but it can also be a pain in the you know what as well because he, you can't. It's very hard to negotiate with him. In fact, it's impossible, pretty much. You know, it's always you, you give it to me now. If you don't give it to me, I'm going to scream and shout until I get what I want. So you can reason with most children. But when, when with Riley, it's very difficult to reason because he doesn't make it, for example, understand what well, we're going to have dinner now. Mm. And, you know, you can have it after your dinner or something like that, you know? Yeah, and just like what you said, I know you understand that some working in brain injury has a process and difficulty. Yes. So we can't process the information as in and when is dinner, what is dinner, what's these words all joined together and really mean? Yes. You know, he doesn't get the concepts in, in, in his mind and he can't, you know, front global stuff. He can't put it all together. Exactly. Where we can say it's this and he's like, what is this? Yeah, yeah. So what we do at Riley now is it's, it's something called pecs and they're pictures. 
Oh, and we okay. have a, it's like a timeline, right? So, for example, with Riley, we'll have uh, we'll start off in the morning where he's going to get dressed, and it'll be a process where it could be a picture of his socks, and when that when that's when he has his socks on, that gets taken off and it gets thrown into the little bucket, and then the next will be let's say his underpants and then his shorts, and when that's done, they're thrown into the bucket, and he can see of the process what's going to happen right through to have his breakfast, right through to have his school bag, right through then to maybe having a treat, but he knows to get that treat at the top. He has to go through all these different pictures. Sequencing. Yes. So there's different ground sequencing. Exactly. And he can identify the picture with something that we have, we're showing him. So, for example, a bowl of cereal, the picture of a bowl of cereal. That's grand. I'm having that. And the next one, I'm going to get that. And then he sees that. And he knows he's climbing that ladder wow. to get the, to the ultimate goal, which is the tree or whatever it may be. So he, he It could be bubbles or whatever he wants. So he's got a great hand around visual processing rather than that verbal processing and comprehension processing. Precisely. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Wow, it's such a learning for you and Amy, isn't oh, it? Oh, right. absolutely. Yeah. And was that? Did you find that way through through just default, or was that? Did you learn? that Oh through no, service? we were taught that. No, we were taught Brilliant. that through service private services that we found. Uh, God, God, we were taught into that used to that quite a couple of years ago. I think we we're called on the spot, but you know we've been obviously meeting lots of different parents, um, in the community who have been able to give us help and give us direction, f- to be able to find these uh, tools. Brilliant! Brilliant! So after the, 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 the chat with the consultant, uh, what was your journey then? Where, where, where did that lead you? What did you do? What did you have to do? Where did you just go from there? Scratching, pulling your hair out, no doubt. So I remember the first thing that we did was kind of panicked and we started kind of, I suppose, trying to get someone to show us where to go. Because it wasn't just, you know, no one hands you a leaflet and says, ring this number. So you're, you're trying to find a diagnosis was the first and most important thing we had to do <clears throat> so I found a doctor just by online just got googled obviously trying to find the best people and we came across a very good um, doctor who's based in the uh, the Beacon Clinic and uh, Dr. Galvin and we got him diagnosed there mm-hmm. and once we had a diagnosis then we were able to go um, and try and get services so from there then we got a, a Seno for example and then um, they then try and give you in our case the, the services that you need so like occupational therapy or speech therapy but there was a huge waiting list for all that stuff so we ended up doing it all privately and then recently the most recent journey was to try and get him a school place but again the centres are, are, are ideally there to help you to try and do that but most or if not all the ASD units are all full so you can't get him into a school because there's no places available wow so that was where our journey's kind of brought us to now but there was a lot obviously in between but that's where that's that's kind of just a very, very quick synopsis of what the centers are, are trying to help you do. But wow. What was the impact like on your family? I know you've got the younger kids as well and you've got a couple older. What, what was the impact of the whole thing coming together? How did that impact you guys and them? Well, my eldest uh, girl, Charlotte, is 13 and Isabella's has just turned 11. Um, I'm separated from my, what, what, their mum. So I'm lucky enough that I joined custody, so I have them half the time. Um, initially I suppose the impact for them wasn't as dramatic because obviously you don't sit down with them straight away and explain to them like this is after happening because you don't really understand it yourself Um, so we kind of organically grew into that and Riley didn't just change overnight once we got the diagnosis so there was nothing for them to worry about they they were he was his little he he was their little brother as, as they knew him so I suppose it's only now as he's getting older that the autism is more obvious. As a three-year-old boy, it wasn't very obvious because he's not meant to be talking. Or he, you know, he's there, thereabouts. But as a six-year-old boy, it's far more obvious. So I think for them now it's a lot harder because they have kids coming around, their mates coming around, or you know, he might be out in the street and somebody might say something. So I think now it's probably a little bit more challenging. So now we would have more conversations around his autism. Um, because they're obviously turning into teenagers and all that kind of stuff. So they're, they're clued in. Mm. And they can see, obviously, Riley's challenges and the things that can be very hard for them. So we have to discuss that a lot more. Things that are hard for them, well, number one, we could be lack of sleep, for example. Like, Riley could be up at three or four in the morning. Really? And when Riley's up, he's up. Do you the know what I mean? Alive. Oh, the house is alive. You know, he wrecked the place. He might want TVs on. He might want to be fed. He might want all the lights on. He might want to go in and play with his brother. You know what I mean? So, so there, that would be a big challenge. Wow. Um, that's probably just one of the first things. And then as the day goes on, 
it would depend where he can get he's getting quite I don't want to use the word angry because it's not fair he doesn't get angry but he's getting very frustrated so that comes out yeah in, the world doesn't in, understand of course he doesn't you know and I can see in him that he's struggling because he wants to communicate um, so therefore that might turn into a serious episode you know what I mean no, no, he's, not, he's not aggressive but he could get very upset and he could be upset for a while you know yeah yeah wow so what do you think let's get into the meat and bones of what do you think that he needs to improve his quality of life going forward services school well I mean for the first and most important thing is that um, Riley needs to get the tools to be able to beat this autism and that's how I describe it beating the autism right sometimes I can see the autism is worse than others and what I mean by that is he can get lost in it right and so I can see Riley from day to day as my son Riley that I know and then other times the autism can take over and consume him and he's completely he's completely gone and he's so far gone I can't even get him back so he's like in his own little world and that world could be really really hyper he doesn't really get too he doesn't really like go withdrawn he gets very 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 outward and he can be running around at a million miles an hour so he he needs to get the tools to be able to learn to fight this autism so that we can keep him on track and then of course it's the tools how to learn and the, the, to, to, I suppose ultimately for me it's to learn to speak and what's, what's involved around that and then of course then to get an education so he needs to learn to read he needs to learn to write all those things have you seen it, have you seen a remarkable difference in the, the, the input of services that can have to date you know the services that you've been using can you see how beneficial they have been and if you are now to get the education that he was improved even more yeah so like we do occupational therapy through horse riding and he finds the horse riding incredibly therapeutic so he wouldn't stim at all. So you know when I talk about him getting lost in the, in the autism, whenever it is about the horse riding, and actually it's you know the movement on the horse and the concentration of holding onto the reins and just even the sitting position, he's very focused. So they can get him to do uh, challenges. For example, he might have to you know string little small beads through a little lace and things like that. He can do that with great accuracy, and he won't stop till he gets it all done. Or they might give him a very you know an easier <laughs> challenge like. Um, you know, when these fake pizzas and he has to put it all in the right order. You know, these little kids' games. Yeah. But he wouldn't do that if he wasn't if he wasn't on that horse. Very seldom. Now, I wouldn't say he wouldn't do it. That's not fair. But when he's on the horse and doing the occupation therapy, he's brilliant at it. Brilliant. So we've seen you, and that helps him concentrate, right? So that's what I'm talking about. He, if we can get him to concentrate and stay focused, he comes out of the autism a lot more. Wow. I believe. That's how yeah. I see it, right? Um, speech therapy. Well, he's not talking, so it's very hard to say. It's it's been a mass improvement, but again, she has ways to get him down. It's not you know again it's eye contact and all that kind of stuff. And she's been really good to get him from where he was to where he is, where to, uh, where he is, especially if he knows he's going to get a treat or he's going to get his you know his games or his bubbles or whatever it is that he wants. Mm. He will interact with you. Will he do it for an hour? No, but you know he'll do it for twenty minutes to half an hour. And he'll come in now and, and again. It, we have seen a huge improvement but we were also in the preschool so it was an ASD preschool and he was in that for two years and they were brilliant and he was working with playing with other children so what, where he came on from there was his interaction with other children and that, that has really brought him on leaps and bounds and it's been really tough now I have to say the last what six eight weeks since he's been on summer holidays like the, I've definitely seen him, the autism coming back a lot stronger than it was when he was in school wow that's how I see it. Where are you at with the whole schooling process? You know, uh, trying to get him in. I know you're yourself and Amy and having great struggles with that. Do you want to share some of that with us? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd be very happy to share it with you because it's not just our story. Unfortunately, it's the story for hundreds and hundreds of parents around the country. And as you said on the outset, it's not just children with autism. There's people who have Down syndrome children who, again, uh, have been denied the education and the support that they need so it's, it's unfortunately and as you quite rightly said and I, I really echo what your point was there seems to be children in this country who I suppose are, need help more than anybody who have been denied these supports and it's just so frustrating because um, you know you think as human beings that you know you want to help people who are less often you and they're the ones that have been left behind and, and people are happy to, to leave them behind and the journey for Riley um We've been very lucky. 
now that we just recently got a school place but i'll get to that in a moment um there was no way all the asd units in our in our area were full so there was nowhere for him to go we couldn't get him into a mainstream school because he was autistic so unless they had a full-time sna which is a special needs assistant they couldn't manage mm. his, his, so they wouldn't take him in um and I'm after losing my train of thought. What did you ask me again? What was the quick second? About the funding for the school and the, the, where you're at with that. And we were talking about, you know, people from marginalised groups not having the services and yeah. where we're at with. Yeah, exactly. So I was just asking me train of thought there That's for a second. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, basically, yeah. So in, in, in our case, we thought we were given like a list of 20 schools. So we thought we were getting a place in the school. So you obviously start off near to your home and you work out. And of course... That school was like, sorry, we've no places left. We'll put them on a waiting list. But there could be 50 people on a waiting list because everyone's getting the same list of schools. So I remember this, this Amy, my partner, was struggled, was banging away on this for about two years. And obviously the window was when schools closed um, in the end of June this year. But I kept thinking, babe, you're doing a great job. You know, this is going to happen. There's no way he's not going to school. So, you know, I was just kind of sitting there, as, as a lot of lads do, leaving the mums to do all the hard work. And uh, eventually, unfortunately, the schools all closed and the window closed with that for him to get a school place. So we're like, oh my God, Royal has no, nowhere to go to school in September. What are we going to do? So um, in my own particular case, I just I have to say, like Amy was devastated. And I was devastated as well because I'm looking at her and I'm looking at her beaten by this, you know, I'm just beaten down by this. And uh, I just thought, well, I'm going to have to do something. And I... And, I was at my daughter's graduation a few weeks earlier. She graduated from primary school. And there's a wonderful school that my kids have gone to for the last eight years, obviously, from when they were in junior infants. And I know the headmistress very, very well. And I know all the teachers very, very well. And we have a great relationship. And they moved into a brand new school. Uh, this, this April just gone. Mm. And the school cost five million euros to build and refurbish, right? Obviously paid by, by the tax uh, payer. And... I asked the headmistress, are you open an ASD unit? And she was like, no, not at the moment. And I was like, why? And she goes, well, there's no funding available and there's a few other reasons as well that's kind of complicated at the moment. So I was quite disappointed by that. But again, I kind of felt as if it was out of my depth and there was nothing I could really do about it, but we were still on our journey trying to get him a school place. But as I said, that window came and went. So I wrote her a letter. When I was at my, my daughter's graduation, I was so moved by what they had experienced in, in, in her time in primary school how positive it was the amazing friends she made how much she loved not just the school but the teachers and how much they loved her how, and everything about it was all so positive and it was the teacher the headmistress stood up at the end and she made a beautiful speech to the children they were very encouraging very motivational and she kept talking about to the children about believing in themselves and always believing that they could go on to achieve great things and never to allow anyone to, to hold them back that they had goals, never lose sight of the goals. And she kept talking about reaching for the stars. Reach for the stars, reach for the stars, reach for the stars. She kept talking about this. And all I could think about was my child at right at home. And he was never going to experience what his three older siblings had experienced. And the teacher came to me. I don't know if I can mention her name, can I? Yeah. Um, Mrs. Sum, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Sumter Currents. And I have a huge amount of admiration for her up until this point, right? Because she runs a great school. And like I said, a great team of teachers. And she came to me afterwards and she was like, so Mark, what did you think of the presentation and the graduation, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, you know, or something, I'm going to be honest, I'm quite overwhelmed at the moment. I can't even put into words what I thought about it. I said, would you mind if I wrote a letter to you when I go home and give it to my daughter, Charlotte, to bring it to you tomorrow? She goes, oh, I'd love that, Mark. So I went home and I put pen to paper and I thanked her for everything that she'd done for my children. With the right, these three older siblings, and I thanked her for the all her team and and, and, and what I and how I felt about them and the respect I had for her and the team. But then I went on to talk about how upset and disappointed I was that Riley was never going to experience that same journey, and I spoke a little bit about that. And I sent it in with, with Charlie with a bunch of flowers as well, by the way, and um, that was grand. That day came and went, and then the next day came and went, and then the next day they closed school down for the for for the summer holidays. So I thought, okay, she has my mobile number. She'd ruined me many times, unfortunately, particularly over my young fella, <laughs> Eli. Um, so she has my mobile numbers, but 
a week went by and then two weeks went by and then I started getting quite angry because I just felt you know what you have to completely ignore my I wouldn't say plea but I sure I reached out to her and she just if I felt blanked it so I took it quite personally right so I got angry then so I was like well, what do I do like who do I turn to now She's like who, who does she answer to so then I'm like do I write a letter to the Board of Education or do I write a letter to the, the Minister of Education and then you're like well what's the point who's going to do what who cares so then I thought I oh, know what I'm going to try and do I'm going to write a letter to my son and I'm going to open up to Riley about his life so far the experience that he's had and that we've had and I'm going to send it to the papers and see if anyone picks up on it so we can get it into the public domain and that's what we did and thankfully we sent it out to a few papers and we very very quickly the Sunday Independent came back to us Brendan O'Connor a wonderful man wonderful editor and wonderful journalist and he said look Mark we really like your letter um, very moved by it and I know it's a story uh, uh, that an awful lot of people are experiencing in this, in this country and we want to we want to put it in Life magazine. So we, we, like, we were thrilled with that and then it got a huge traction mm. and great awareness. I was writing on Darren earlier about it. It was absolutely blew me away. Uh, the way you wrote it, actually the, the, the structure of it, mm. you start off with royalty, mm. uh, powerful, and the, the bit about you and your missus had broke up. Mm. He's got back together, mm. started crying about that. That was a lovely piece, thought it was lovely. And in the end, oh, I was just really, really good and it was just, hit every point I just I thought it was powerful thanks man and and the, the mad thing about it is you know it opened up a huge can of worms I knew, I knew it was bad I knew there was a lot of people in our situation I didn't realise it was as bad as it is like there's literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids out there with autism who aren't going to school this this, this uh, oh September. yeah it's, it's de- desperate like I yeah. see it in disabilities I didn't think I thought everyone outside my hospital treats dis- disabilities with equality and love and care kindness happiness fucking hell since I I started doing this podcast and interviewing people not all people with disabilities but they're treated like second class citizens you know you talk about the travelling community getting Mm. a bad Mm. you know people in wheelchairs people live with disabilities brain injury autism just left the home to to give society actually yeah we'll get back to you in a while yeah it's appalling I want to get this fella's tax I'll get you in a minute yeah it's fucking desperate it's absolutely appalling it's heartbreaking yeah it really is I mean look I'm not one of these people like you know for about entitlement and all that kind of stuff, but this is in our constitution that all the children in Ireland need to have should have an education, and they've been denied their constitutional right. And I'm not allowed to break the law, and you're not allowed to break the law, but yet they'll break the law and they'll keep these children out of school. Yeah. And I just think it's disgusting. Did you say there's one in an ASD unit in D- Dublin 15? Do we talk about this today? So, when I was talking to the guys in As I Am they were able to tell us you see the minister was given the power about a year ago i believe or certainly in january i think um that he can force a a school to open an asd unit as a last resort as a last resort not as a first resort but as a last resort so the teachers and the headmistresses in particular masters i should say the principals of the school i should say i beg your pardon if they don't want to open an asd unit they can file it they can they can offer reasons as to why they don't they shouldn't have to do it. This particular principal that in the school that my kids go to in St. Francis of Assisi, again, she there a, a law was passed that all new schools must open an ASD unit. Her argument is one of her arguments, I believe. Now I haven't heard this from her mouth. I'm hearing this from other people, uh, particularly um, a, a senator that we're working with. That it's not a new school; it's a new building. Now I just think that's again appalling that someone would try and use the play and the trick words, is it? Right, yeah. Ask me, boys. Right to say, well, then we're not going to open ASD because this isn't a new school, so we don't have to fall into that rule. But, but you know, but this is a person who's now supposed to be in the business of educating children and helping children. Don't piss on me and tell me it's raining. Right, there you go. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Exactly. Fuck off. I love it. There you go. I love it. So yeah, so. Um, that was the journey, and then of course there was a, we 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 ironically and just completely coincidentally throughout this whole journey, someone sent us a link <coughs> to a new school that's opening up in Sutton. It's an Educate Together school. Cool. So Amy filled out the application online, and we just moved on. And last week we got a call from the woman. She was like, "Listen, Riley's down on the list here 
for a place in the school she would want to meet up and have a chat and he's like of course I'd be delighted to and then they talked for a minute or two and then maybe put down the phone she was like uh, she felt as if she had lied or deceived to the woman because she didn't say listen are you aware that Riley's ASD so she started panicking oh my god I gotta go meet this woman that was another Monday she'd meet the woman on Wednesday and she was like oh my god I should have said something to the woman I was like listen relax this is all going to play out she, you know she's just going to be able to do something or she's not just go and meet her and have a chat but Amy rightfully so emailed uh, her, uh, Riley Steno officer and then within half an hour she got a call from uh, one of the people in the Seno office and she goes listen Riley, Amy we're very aware of, of Riley's case everybody's talking about it and everyone's really upset about it but she goes unfortunately this is a situation that we have with hundreds of kids across the country right so you're not alone on this but she goes, we're banging our heads off the wall because we're asking the Department of Education to open more uh, ASD units or make more places available or make more uh, SNAs available. And they're ignoring us. Um, so, so they're struggling as well to, to do their job because they're not getting the support that they need from the Department of Education. Yes. right? And we're all looking at these Senate officers and going, oh, they're not doing their job or they don't care. It's not that at all, but they, they just can't either you know, make something out of thin air. It's the system. Right? And um, long story short, she goes, I know the school you're talking about. I know the teacher and the headmistress you're talking about. She goes, I only recently placed and made funding available for one SNA because there's one autistic kid already going in there. She goes, well, I'm telling you now, we can make another SNA available for Riley. So she goes, you meet the teacher tomorrow and you let her know that. Anyway, the woman, the woman called me, came in. She goes, I don't believe you. She goes, I'm following your story. She goes, I didn't know it was you that I was meeting. She goes, I didn't make the connection. Anyway, they, they hit it off. The woman told Amy all about her story and her background with teaching. And unbelievably, she has a background in ASD teaching as well. So the school is open on the 2nd of September. It's in Sutton. It's only going to be a small um, prefab. There's only going to be eight kids in the class. Deadly. Six are what they call typical kids now, and two are ASD. And both the ASD kids are going to have their own SNA. So we're, we're incredibly grateful. We feel as if it was, you know, it came from divine intervention it didn't come from the people that we reached out to it didn't come from the people that we asked for help I believe of angels in heaven who helped kind of bring this all together I, I believe in the collective unconscious I think all the work you did all the, the energy the systems is all working in your favour if you had a sat at home on your, your hands this would never happen. no it definitely wouldn't have happened you know what I mean? oh, like 100% man, like you know I do believe in angels I believe in, in you know the manifestation yes. of your actions yeah well that, 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 that too I do believe, you, I believe you're right there but still the people that we asked for help the people that we believe were accountable didn't reply to us didn't get involved and there was countless letters sent into departments and none of them were ever answered um, and that still leaves a bit of taste in my mouth because there's so many people around the country who are in our situation who can't be heard and are being ignored and it sickens me so I don't know. I mean, I don't know where to go next. But I mean, things like this really help because the more, the more, the more we can kind of get the voice out there mm. and put pressure on. I believe the minister to force these schools to open ASD units, the better. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. And what you asked me before about, and the reason I got into the story was, I believe that Dublin Fifteen have made forty places available. And what the most ironic thing about that is that that's Leo Vradka's consistency. So, is that a coincidence? You tell me. I don't believe in coincidence. If it looks like shit and it smells like shit, I won't be eating it. I think it's shit. You know, like, let's call it fucking spade a spade. Like, right. like that's not coincidence, you no, know. And that's, it's, it's these inequalities and injustice that just are really, really oh, so frustrating, isn't it? Especially when you're in the trenches like you are that's with it. Royley and other people in, in, in don't the fucking me, yeah. trenches. I'm, and I'm delighted for those children in the 150. Oh, yeah, they deserve it, right? It's yeah. not about them. No, absolutely not. But here's another, another uh, ironic thing for I'm going to run by you. Like, I was told this, that a lot of SNAs are getting let go or they're not making funding available for as, as more SNAs. And it comes down to two overspends. And one, you won't be surprised. Obviously, the overspend with the children's hospital. Right? We all know about that. But the overspend on the Wi-Fi rollout around the country is re another reason why they're making so many cutbacks. So they're, so they're putting Wi-Fi, uh, the Wi-Fi rollout above the education for children, in the, in the underprivileged children in this country. Yes. I'm thinking yeah. the Wi-Fi is just to have the teachers deliver education more, I don't know, state of the art. Well, it's not, no, not in the schools, not in the schools. I'm talking about the oh, 
the Wi Fi rollout in the country. In the country? In the country. Fuck off. Yes. Really? Yeah, so, so Mr. You know, so Aaron can get Wi Fi in his gaff yeah. quicker and he can be looking at all those yeah, places. So, 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 they can Aaron, run, fuck you. so they can run business down in the country easier because obviously they'll have their Wi Fi. That's fucking bananas. Right? Now, I understand that, you know, people around the country need Wi Fi. I get it. How do you justify but that? Well, you can't justify it. The, the current government is putting the Wi Fi rollout above the education of children in this country. That's fucking desperate. I can't get my head around that. Yeah. Jeez, I'll let that sink in for a while. Fucking didn't know that. Yourself and Amy have raised so much awareness, you know, uh, your own profile, the, the work you did, your linking in with medias, come on podcast and all, about, and then your own education around autism and all that. What's, what's one of the, the biggest learnings that you have had in this process on your journey? That's a big question, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> like what would give give us a like? It doesn't have to be that big. What kind of learning have you learned? Yeah, you've learned about royalty and it supports you guys to provide and be better parents. Um, or have we I, touched on it already? Have we touched about the inequalities, the the lack of finances, and all that? It, it's a, yeah. It, I mean, you're absolutely right. I suppose you know. It's, it's, sometimes you, it can be a very lonely place. You know what I mean? Sometimes you feel, oh, okay. you know, that people don't understand, and that's that's that, that's quite challenging. So it's learning to to understand. It's learning to accept that they don't understand. You know, don't get angry because somebody throws me my, my dirty look because they think I'm being a bad father. You know, because I can't control my son, or my son's having a, an absolute meltdown. You know. Um. So to learn to be patient and learn to be, understand that, that you know that they may be just ignorant to the situation, and that's okay. Because two, t- three years ago, I would have been ignorant to the situation. Of course. So. And I see that played out when I go out and out with the job, and I, I we work with people with brain injury. Yeah. And I watch the uh, integrating in the community, and you know whether they go up and ask people or stuff or their behaviour, and I watch other people watching them. And it's really difficult. And I empathise, yeah, yeah. you know, if I was their partner, if yes. I was their family member. And the public don't know. Yes. They don't know. They don't and that's know. That's okay. They don't know. You know what I mean? Just, we don't we don't know everything. We can't read minds, you know? Yeah. It's really hard as a father, isn't it? And your kid, you see other kids, and then parents are judging you. And society can be absolutely fucking yeah. really cruel. You just have to put blinkers on, you know? Like, I've made mistakes myself, I'm sure, over the years with t- similar situations. So you have to just understand that. Mm, absolutely what's been the most frustrating for you and Amy so far uh, the whole process definitely this whole school team by far was the most frustrating I mean every single step of the way there was no support like, I'm lucky enough when people say I'm lucky enough that you, I can afford to pay for is all this private stuff and there, you are right it didn't happen by luck it happened by a lot of hard work but I can afford to get a lot of private support but that obviously if I couldn't do that would be just as frustrating as the school the school situation there is no private school for, for Riley to go to you know so it doesn't matter how deep your pockets are you can't throw money at this I need to get him in to, so we needed to get him into national school and preferably an ASD unit but the, how it's turned out is equally as good for us but that was an unbelievably frustrating experience then of course you know lobbying and um the, the Department of Education and calling on the ministers to stand up and do some and, and to help and just to be ignored time and time and time again that's very frustrating mm-hmm. um, you just lose faith in the democracy and you lose the, your faith in, in your government and, and what, the, what they're really there for, to do you know you become hardened don't you you can become you can cynical become and... cynical because you're like you know you look at, at certain ministers and you know, you you're all over the paper talking about autism, and they're down opening golf clubs, talking about tourism instead of talking about education. And you're like, well, what are you in this for? You're just in it for an Instagram picture, you know, just in it to build your profile. Mm-hmm. You know, you're down opening fair enough as consistency as Limerick, so you know, you got to go down and shake hands as well. But you have a job to do, so do your job. Like I, I, I obviously work in the private sector, I have my own business, and we're accountable for, and everyone who works for me is accountable for their job role. Who's accountable? You know, do your job. And if you don't want to do the job, step aside and let somebody else come through who wants to do it. Do it. Like there's been great ministers who've done things over the years. And I'm, you know, and I'm not mean to do them injustice. I know, I know it's a very tough 
ask and oh it's a big job but someone's going to have to do it because it's only going to get worse autism's not going away autism is getting there's more and more diagnosis in autism every single year mm. and if they don't take action now and put measures in place now in three four five years they're going to have a huge huge problem mm. i was only talking to somebody today about this uh somebody like two thousand two thousand euros to get somebody a, a child assessed privately they can't oh, fucking get my mind around as i talked to someone as well about ad and adhd for adults to get done it's something like 1700 or 1800 to go to go private well unreal isn't it it's unreal absolutely yeah but you have to get a diagnosis before you can even get onto the system and say okay i have a child now who's got autism where do i go well you know that's when that's when you're supposed to get the help but as i mentioned already and then you talk about classes if you're going to go working class or whatever people in working class don't have that kind of no, money and then absolutely not. If, you know if you go in the system you're probably talking six months year two year at least at least at least at least so if you want to go private which is the and way you want a golden ticket 2g yeah and then if you so if you're waiting two three years then early in, intervention's gone out the window it's not early anymore and then you've lost uh child development yes you know you're already on the back foot then exactly and so then where the autism you, really sets in then yeah you know the child hasn't uh mentally uh psychologically no developed yeah. he's already on the back foot then yeah. and then so, so it's it's, it's, it's it's a and the walls keep going the barriers keep going up so it's hard to get to crack it then mm. and that's what i'm talking about like there's tall people are saying again the experts out there are saying things like this that dublin and ireland and ireland could become the autism capital of europe it's getting that bad i've heard people say that the 10 years ago there's one in 200 chance that your child could be autistic at the moment it's one in 75 and in less than five years, we won in 50. And why is that? Well, again, no, I, 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 there's a lot of people would say, well, they're, they're giving diagnoses out there a lot quicker than they used to, or it's a lot easier to get a diagnosis. And that may be partly true, but there's definitely an epidemic in, in, in autism. There's, it's for whatever reason, there's a lot more kids now with autism than ever before. But why? I can't tell you why. Mm. There's, again, there's a lot of people that have theories on it, but no, there's no sound actual medical reason why a child is autistic. From what I can see, mm. wow. have you come across one? No, I would say I'd probably go with the, my my hypothesis, my brain that one would be that I'd say that a lot of them there already. It's I would say it's more the the advancement in diagnosis, assessment, mm. uh, awareness. You know, we as as human beings, we our evolution is very very slow. Mm. So I don't th- I don't think this is a 2019 epidemic. Maybe I think it's always been the case. Or just that there's a light being shined on it which is fantastic very difficult for the kids probably would have been deemed as just bold brats undeveloped whatever whatever now like these kids there's assessment there for them and we can get them service but unfortunately the services the funding the systems haven't caught up with the advances mm. of the assessments maybe i don't know i think i think things like adhd is slightly different right because it's an attention deficit so we probably all had I probably had it and we all probably had friends in school who had that but it was never mm-hmm. diagnosed the autism that Riley has and the other children like Riley that I've seen I, I have never seen as much of that before you know as kids growing up I didn't really see you know anyone with a brother or a sister with a kid like that you know what I mean mm-hmm. maybe they were whipped off into a home or something like that I don't think that was the case either mm-hmm. but um, I, I'm going to go further with this I'm going to like myself myself have this interview I want to get someone else on it mm-hmm. I'm hoping to actually interview uh, a doctor or a consultant around ADHD and uh, autism and that kind of spectrum I, I, I look, that question really is going to yeah is going to stick in my mind now why I yeah. always like to know the why I'm trying to find out the why as well <laughs> yeah like let's get the get to the the crux of that i don't mean to be sexist in this from a father to a father mm. or a, a, you know a, a main caregiver mm. we'll go father because i'm a father you're a father mm. for me reading your story listen to the, the interviews you did it was i would have felt really frustrated uh helpless how how did this impact you as a father figure yeah it, it, it's it's very challenging on so many levels because First and foremost, you know, you, you, the woman you love, you can see is heartbroken, right? She's heartbroken for because the work and the challenge that she's had, I, you know, really beat her down. But then, of course, she's looking at her son, who's the apple of her eye. She wants him to have the most normal life that he can have, and she's worried about, you know, will he speak? Will he learn to read and write? Will he be able to go and hold down a job? Will he be able to have a, boy, a girl, boyfriend or a girlfriend? It doesn't matter. You know, what future will he have? 
when we're old, right? So you see her and, and you're talking constantly and you, about that emotion, that stress that she has. And then, of course, you're feeling it yourself. Um, because, of course, you want all those things for your child. Um, and you would hope that he was going to go on to do whatever he wanted to do. It didn't matter if he wanted to come to work with me or if he wanted to go off and be a rock star. So you're worried and think, God, it's, where is he going to be in five years' time, 10 years' time, 20 years' time? And you're constantly worried about that, and, that, and that's very... Um, yeah, it's just stressful, really, you know. Mm. I love the way you finished the letter, though, about uh, taking some time off school. Yeah. He says, I might let you away, but your man <laughs> definitely won't. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. It was fantastic. You know, just like what you said earlier about uh, really getting uh, consumed by his autism mm. and the, how as, it's easy for you and the family to get consumed by this whole process. Yeah. How have you stopped yourself and uh, how have you s- prevented that from happening? Or I, 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 I honestly think... Uh, my, my main worry is that we're only getting into the mix of it now. Uh, Riley at three and Riley at four is still a baby, really, you know what I mean? He's five going on six now. So it's a different animal. It's a different beast you're dealing with now, right? And I am I think we're kind of really getting to the most challenging parts of his autism now because before he was just, you could kind of fob it off a little bit, you know what mm. I mean? But now we're really getting into the challenge of it. I think I think there's, there, there's harder days to come. Um, that would be our main concern. So, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. What would you say to families or people that have found themselves in the same position that you did a couple of years back? What, what words of wisdom would you share with people? Well, I mean, obviously it's a very tough situation that anyone will find themselves in when they get they're going to go through a series of emotions. Um, they have to obviously, first of all, get the diagnosis and then they need to, you know, go and get in touch with the centre officer and they need to get into the system as quick as they can. They need to make sure that they get uh, the, right, the right support that's as best possible. But I suppose, there's, I personally would uh, advise someone to reach out to someone with autism groups out there. Um, my boy Blue, obviously as I am, is an autistic uh, uh, charity and I think they primarily work with adults but they are starting to work more with children and autism but there's some great um, support um, Facebook links and, and uh, Instagram pages and things like that and you can reach out to people and they get some help and advice and stuff but uh, yeah it's um, looking back now if I was to try and talk to myself three years ago I'd probably just say something like Mark you know great bit of advice my father gave me many many years ago was how do you eat an elephant how do what? eat an elephant it's one bite at a time and I think that's one bit of advice I try and give myself three years ago was love it don't try and do it all at once you just take it a little step at a time you know you're going to learn every day you're going to grow into this every single day it's not like someone just flip the switch and everything changes so that's a savage analogy if you can get your diagnosis early you have a little bit of time and you can can grow into it then with your family fantastic Uh, as we talked about earlier and it never seems to uh, cease to amaze me how low down the priority uh, people from disabilities you know marginalized groups the vulnerable is that something that's really blown your mind away? Did you know it was as evident as that till you start getting into this? I didn't know, you know. I mean, like the average man on the street, I was ignorant to it as well, you know. I worked in disability and yeah. I didn't know. I thought I lived in this cocoon in the hospital. Yeah. Thinking, ah, everyone's uh, Mary Poppins and mm. bed knobs and broomsticks till I get outside and, you know, got into the real world and all with these people. And I, Fuck. I think that's why the story got so much traction and so much support because I think again the average man on the street and the average man and woman on the street I beg your pardon weren't aware of how bad it was and then made the connection with their own kids with their own grandkids you know their, their, their nieces their nephews and now if you thought this, this could be us this could be somebody I love and this is wrong and that's the kind of worms that I think this letter opened up from where I can see it in our bubble you know um, 
we're all like in the autism community and was like, no, we've been dealing with this all the time. I've meet people who have got kids who are 15 and they were dealing with the worst 15 years ago. So, you know, it, it, in the autism community, it's like this day by day by day, but so I don't think the average man in the street was anywhere aware, but they are now, and they're you know, obviously as concerned now more than ever. Mm. And nothing hooks people like the, oh, this could be my sister, yes. this could be my, or my sister has a kid like yeah. that, so we have a kid. Then all of a sudden, we stop dehumanising and then we go, ah, oh, these are human, we can exactly. connect with these. Before you would just be white noise on the telly, ah, oh, autism, I don't want to go autism, fuck that. That's all the Then all of a sudden, oh, my brother's kid is autistic, let's have a listen to this. Yes. Fuck. My auntie could be, it's amazing, isn't it? So we need more of this, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. This wasn't on my list of questions, but would you mind talking to me a little bit about, you wrote in the, in the letter about you falling back in love with your wife mm. or your, your partner. Fiance now, yeah. Yeah, right, so that's it, they're getting married. <laughs> uh, tell us that, come to that realisation, that I just well, read that, I loved yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I don't, every cloud is a silver lining, yeah? And that was one of the, that's the, the silver linings that we had out of this experience, like, and this is gonna go back to your real, uh, or really answer your question about, you know, as, as a father, right? When, when Riley was diagnosed, now don't get me wrong, I love, of course I love all my children, but Riley needs me more. And will always need me more than my other children, right? And something clicked inside of me that I was never going to let him down. Not that I ever wanted any of my children down, but no matter what it was going to take, I'd walk in whatever hot colds, and I'd, 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 I'd take any fight on that I had to take on. And when I saw his mum with the same attitude, and I saw his mum with the same determination that I had, I just saw her differently. And then I wanted to be around Riley all the time. I didn't want to have him. We broke up, so I was only getting 50, 50, 50 percent of the time. That wasn't enough for me anymore. So my admiration and the way I looked at Amy changed completely again. I had her on a pedestal again. And then I just fell in love with her all over again. And in a different way, because I didn't fall in love, I didn't fall in lust with her, I fell in love with her. And that came from admiration, and it came from respect. Which is probably some way, way, way I didn't look at her before, but I looked at her before, you know, mm. as you do, beautiful women. <laughs> yeah, wow. So, uh, our, our love really grew from, from, from Riley's diagnosis. Uh, fantastic, I love it. Thanks for sharing that, I really appreciate it. Right, I've took up a lot of your time now. What's the one thing you'd like people to take away from this interview after listening to yourself, Amy's story, and Riley's journey? I, might, I would like for people to feel that, as I do that there's not enough being done for the most vulnerable children in this country. And it's not just children with autism, we touched on that already. There's loads of children out there with disabilities that have been left at home. In my opinion, they don't care about them, they were left at home to rot. And I think the country needs to get behind this and something needs to change and needs to change quickly. Because this is only gonna get worse. The people who are in the jobs who can make a difference need to stand up and do their jobs properly. Or step aside and let somebody else do it. Because, like I said already, we are, we are heading towards a serious crisis. And unless the people of Ireland demand for for the something to change, this is just going to be pushed under the carpet again. Can't say any more than that. Mark O'Keefe, uh, I thank you. Thanks very much for sharing your story. Thanks for sharing your vulnerability. I hope we've done royally a service. I hope we've done autistic children a service and people of disability service. And I thank you and I thank you for coming on the podcast. An absolute legend. And it's supposed to be the pleasure of mine. And I'm incredibly grateful that you gave us the opportunity to talk about it, Matt. So thanks a million. Absolute legend, absolute legend.